Okay, party people. This is it. The final day of Deuterus Dumps. Can't believe we've made it. Well, I guess we haven't made it yet, so I better get started, right? All right, so we ended last time with the first cholesterols that we were talking about, right? We talked about horseshoe crabs, which are class Meristomata, just to review from lab. So now we're going to move through some more cholesterols. So we're in phylum Arthropoda within the Ectozoa, or the molting animals. Subphylum Cholicerata, the cholesterols. So now we're moving into class Arachnida, okay, the arachnids, and we're going to talk about the spiders. So spiders are members of order Araneae, and they comprise over 30,000 species, lots of spiders. You've probably noticed there are lots of different kinds of spiders. And these are really important predators, particularly in terrestrial environments, okay? And they have these lovely, uh, well, they have spinnerets, these lovely organs through, by which they are able to spin their silken webs, and they use those webs for catching prey. You are probably familiar with spiders, so don't have to spend a ton of time on that. But what they'll do is they'll hang out on their web, and they'll wait for some sort of, typically an insect, but really it could be anything, uh, to come and get caught in the web because it's sticky. And they, the movements of the web alert the spider that there's something there. So they'll go and wrap it up using, using their spinnerets. They will actually basically cocoon it up. And they will either save it for later or they'll eat it at that time. Okay, you can watch this video here. Um, I'm not going to spend time right now going through that. I'm going to let you watch that yourself. But just know spiders really common, especially in North America. And t all spiders, true spiders, so not granddaddy long legs are not true spiders. They're not actually spiders at all. So just know when I was a little girl, I was told, you know, some tale about granddaddy long legs biting you and it's so poisonous it would kill you. If it could, but its mouth is too small, that's not true at all. So just know that. They actually don't even really have a way to do that. They essentially use their pharynx to suck liquefied food, as we mentioned in the last lecture. But true spiders do have, on their chelicerae, their fangs, they have um, poison injecting, a poison injecting apparatus on each fang. Poison injector, I guess, is, or a needle-like um portion of the fang. It's a fang. You know what I'm talking about. So two really common uh, venomous spiders in the temperate zone in North America that you may be familiar with are the black widow here, and they have a little red hourglass on their ventral side, and the brown recluse. And these, like I said, these are two very common spiders. You often will find them in your basement. I had a fun uh, summer at Lion once. They're hopefully not there anymore. But I had a fun summer living on the row doing research. Uh, that's where they used to house us, was on the row during the summer. And uh, my dresser was literally, literally full of brown recluses. That was fun. So those are two venomous spiders who actually can cause damage to humans. Uh, the bite of a black widow and brown recluse can actually be fatal, uh, particularly the black widow. The black brown recluse, you tend to have more of, um, both of them cause necrosis of tissues, which means it causes the tissue to die. But the brown recluse is really more associated with necrosis, uh, localized necrosis. A black widow can can be fatal depending on, depending on the animal that it bites. Um, but brown recluses, you know, I, my dad had a brown recluse bite. Maybe you've been bit by brown, brown recluse and have seen what happens. The tissue will die and actually kind of liquefy. It's pretty yuck. So they both would require treatment uh, if you were ever bitten by any both, both of those spiders. Okay. Now, let's talk about some other arachnids. Arachnids in order Acari are ticks. So ticks and mites, these are terrestrial, as you do also have aquatic mites. Folks are always seem surprised when, uh, if they're identifying invertebrates in my lab, they they bring me over and they're like, this thing looks like a tick. It looks like a tick. It's not a, I don't, it's got eight legs. I don't know. And I'm like, oh yeah, but it's a water mite. And they're like, <gasps> and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's acari. That's a, that's a water mite. And they're like, no. And I'm like, it's okay. It's fine. 
So many mites are actually herbivorous. Um, so there are quite a few mites that don't are not parasitic. They are uh, they just feed on primary production. But you are probably most familiar with ticks. Do I have more here? No. You're probably most familiar with ticks. And those ticks can be a nuisance, not just for the fact that they suck. Um, here you have this horrifying image of seed ticks. I have lots of traumatic experiences. I'm sure many of you who have spent time outside in the summertime in the south have probably run into seed ticks. They get everywhere. I have you. I won't spend time in a lecture telling you my horror stories, but if you ever want to hear about them, um, I'm happy to tell you about the time my son ended up with a scrotum full of seed ticks. That was completely my fault uh, from field work. That was cool. No, it wasn't. Um, he still remembers it, unfortunately. And you also have, so here, you have uh, evidence, symptoms of, the, of tick-borne disease, and it's hard to see on the Rocky Mountain spot, spotted fever. So tick-borne diseases, these, these arachnids are important for a couple of reasons. And people always ask me, they're like, oh, can't we just do without ticks? Can we not have ticks? Ticks have an, they serve an important purpose in an ecosystem. If for nothing other than population control, because they carry these diseases. That's a density dependent factor. That means it's dependent on the density of the animals. You're going to have, um, you know, a larger population will, will support more parasites. And then you're going to have a larger incidence of these diseases. So it works to control the population. Um, but here, this particular tick, you notice, and this is a female. You have a red epistosoma and a very dark brown prosoma up here. This is a female deer tick. And the female deer tick um, is a carrier of Lyme disease. And we have seen these more and more in Arkansas. These just came in the last maybe 10 or 15 years. And uh, and I can tell you they're here because in December I was I was privileged. That's not a good word for that. To see a male and female deer tick mating on my backpack. I was in the field and I looked down to grab something out and there was clearly something red and I was like, what? It was a female deer tick and there was like something on her on, on the underside. You could tell something was holding onto her. So the female is on top and they're actually facing each other. The male holds on from the bottom to fertilize the female and um, the female's go, um, gametes. So, and the male is much smaller and just kind of brown. They almost look like small dog ticks, the males do. But they are deer ticks. It's a different kind of tick, and they can give you Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is um, a pretty nasty tick-borne disease that can be treated with antibiotics. Um, this is the telltale Lyme disease. Uh, we call that the target, the target rash. The it's a bullseye or bullseye rash. I think of a target um, bullseye. Same thing. So you have a really bright center and then a ring around it. If you ever see this, you should immediately seek medical attention because the sooner you, you treat Lyme disease, the better off you'll be. It is very treatable in the early, early stages with antibiotics. However, a lot of folks don't realize they have it and then they end up with chronic Lyme, which is potentially life-threatening because it can cause a whole host of systemic issues. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it in the lecture since we're just talking about ticks themselves. But just know it is a pretty nasty infection and can cause all sorts of things like, um, you know, joint stiffness and heart problems, really nasty things. So that's Lyme disease. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is carried by what we call the Lone Star Tick, which is the tick with the white dot on the back. If you've ever seen that, that is a Lone Star Tick. And they carry Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is an illness. You can see there's a bunch of, this guy has, it's almost poxy looking. And it is a life-threatening illness as well. If you develop Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, you should seek medical attention immediately. If you think you have it, if you have a pretty high fever that doesn't go away and you end up with this systemic rash, you should go to the doctor anyway, right? Yes. So um, I've known folks with both of these diseases and because I'm a field ecologist. And so that is one of the hazards of my job. Uh, I have a friend actually who she got Lyme disease one summer and so she was off work for a week or two to recuperate and then she got Lyme disease again so she just had to go home and not be an intern the rest of the summer because she kept getting Lyme disease 
Um, and then also I've known folks who've gotten Rocky Mountain spotted fever and they're typically, uh, typically they can treat it at home, but in an older individual that I know, they ended up being admitted to the hospital. It can be, again, life-threatening. So these are very serious illnesses that these arthropods actually can cause. And that's most of the interaction that you will have with ticks, that or your animal. And you should always check your animals for ticks. My dog actually was sick a couple of days ago with what we're pretty sure was a tick-borne illness that thankfully she fought off. Uh, but it was pretty scary for a couple of days. I called the vet and they said, you know, she started to act better on the third day because you usually wait maybe one or two days. She was okay. Um, the third day I called the vet, you know, and said, should I go ahead and bring her in? They said, no, just, just watch her. And sometimes those ticks are tick fevers will go away and you think you're better and then they'll recur. So that's when you know you really need to go in. Okay, so that's enough about order acari, the ticks and mites. They are arachnids still. We also, um, you also have scorpions who are arachnids, of course. So let's talk about crustacea. So now we're moving from chelicerata to crustacea. The crustaceans are the little stuff my family seems to like to eat. So um, got some crabs. Got some sh shrimps, got some crayfish, right? You got, what do you got? Oh, these are copepods. They're very small, microscopic, uh, aquatic frust frustrations. Yes, crustaceans. Isopods, amphipods. These are all crustaceans, okay? And they live in a, but they pretty much live everywhere. You have semi terrestrial crustaceans. You have Marine crustaceans, like here is saltwater. Freshwater crustaceans, of course, like crayfish. And amphipods are actually small freshwater shrimp. Um, you have small freshwater isopods, small freshwater, what else? I can't remember what, oh, copepods, these little guys here. They're, they're very tiny. You, you almost wouldn't be able to see them. When you, if you take ecology, although we're actually going to do an experiment with copepods, um, but we see them all the time in streams and lakes. And then you also, of course, have some terrestrial crustaceans, such as certain crabs. Okay, there's 65,000 species of crustaceans. I want to make it clear to you, I'm teaching you all these numbers of species. That's just to give you an idea of the diversity uh, and the idea of the abundance of these various taxa. You don't have to know the exact number of species. I don't expect you to be able to tell me that there are 65,000 species of crustaceans. That's really just for reference, okay? And that's true for all of the animals that I tell you there's, you know, there's 42,000 species of these. You don't have to know the exact number. I'm just telling you that for, you know, for you to be like, whoa, that's a lot of species. Yeah. So crustaceans are super important to humans for a few reasons. Um, and I wanted to look, yeah, we're going to talk about body plants. Good. Uh, primarily as a food source. Uh, very important for the economy as, you know, especially coastal economies. <laughs> and they're integral to not only the human food chain, but also marine, freshwater, and terrestrial food webs. Okay, They have very important parts to play in those food webs. So let's talk. Oh, wait, I skipped something. Let me go back. All right, so let's talk about the body plan of a crustacean. This is mainly uh, kind of review from lab, right? Okay, so they have three bodily segments. However, that head and thorax are fused into a cephalothorax. They have two pairs of antennae. They have actual antennae and then antennules. That is a hallmark of the crustacea. They have three pairs of appendages for feeding, which uh, we went over in lab, right? So you have... Ma maxillipeds for feeding. They have walking legs, and these appendages are all biramus, which means they are forked at the end there, right? Remember that from lab. Okay, and the way that um, crustaceans breathe, essentially, or respire is via gills that are right underneath that carapace. They're very feather-like, okay? Um, and just to kind of go over some of this here, um, briefly. Oh, hey. So we have your chelipeds here. Those are those claws, right? You've got antennae and antennules, all right? It doesn't really show very easily. You've got maxillipeds, which are used for feeding. Um, you've got down here on the inside, remember, these are swimmerettes that are important. They do have some function in swimming, but they're mostly for reproduction, 
Okay, swim rats are primarily for reproduction. This is on the ventral side of the animal. And then here in the middle here, you have the telson. And on the other side, you have uropods, which are important for locomotion and swimming. So this part, this anterior part of the animal is the cephalothorax. And that, and that posterior part of the animal, that is the abdomen. Okay, great. So crustaceans are gonochoric, which means that you have male and female. And I'll show you in a few minutes precisely how to sex, we call it sexing, sex a crayfish and, and various other kinds of crustaceans, except for barnacles. So barnacles are not gonochoric. You do not have male and female barnacles. They are monoecious, um, but they do cross fertilize each other, kind of like earthworms do. Okay, cool. Oh, and just showing you a couple of these little buddies. So um, if you're not familiar, you've got, so these are amphipods. Those are those freshwater shrimp. Um, not a really good, this is, looks like this is a little crayfish right there. It's kind of hard to tell. This is the end of a copepod with eggs. All right. And I'm going to be honest with you, I can't remember what I was showing you here. I'm sorry. Again. Oh, yeah, no, I zoom. Here is the underside of, um, looks to be a, it's a lobster or a crayfish, but there are actually um, eggs developing embryos, not just eggs, fertilized eggs, um, embryos on the under, underside there, because the females will actually carry the eggs around them. We call that being in berry. You don't have to know that, but they, if you look at the underside of a, of a female crayfish in berry, there are, it looks like she's got a bunch of very tiny crayfish underneath her and little, and little clear pods. It's really cute, actually. So let's talk a little bit about development of crustaceans. Mainly, there's not a ton you need to know. Don't worry. But essentially, they tend to stay in the egg until they hatch out and they look like a little crustacean. However, um, they go through this Nauplia stage. And the Nauplia stage is a hallmark of crustacea. So this, and this Nauplia stage is one of the clues we have that all of them shared a common ancestor. So it was really important. This Nauplia stage was the clue, um, early clue in resolving crustacean phylogeny. Here's an actual picture of a Nauplius. So Nauplii, which is the plural for Nauplius, these are the larvae. They have three appendages, okay? And they actually will go through um, a couple of metamorphoses before they become full adults. So you have the Nauplius larva here. You don't have to know the various stages, okay? I just want you to know that they are, the crustaceans have a Nauplius larva, okay? You'll see this word again in ecology too. All right, so that's all you need to know about that. But one cool thing I wanna tell you about is crustace or crustaceans. I am telling you about those. Barnacles. So barnacles are crustaceans. They're sessile and Basically, you've probably seen barnacles on maybe ships um, or rocks if you've ever been to the ocean. And when you have a barnacle, they go through the Nauplius stage, but then they have this other stage. You don't have to know the Cypress stage, but then they become an adult. And here's what's really cool. So pre-living barnacles um, attach to substrate with these glands. They have like basically, they're called cement glands. And so they form that hard base, right? And so they become fixed to this place. And essentially it's like held there by its forehead because those cement glands, so the cement glands are basically, they're secreting this from the base of their antennae on their head. So they basically, do this and they stick to a place like this that's fun all right and inside um the, the animal will end up with its limbs projecting upwards so these are actually the barnacle's legs and the rest of the animal is in here okay so if you could actually see it so here are the legs, here's the head. And so basically the cement glands you have from the antennae have secreted this home you might think of, this, this carapace there for the barnacle. It's gonna stay there. That carapace is not part of, part of the barnacle that will move because they're sessile. 
And essentially, the it's like it's on its back, but its head is stuck. That's barnacles, man. I promise. So they're filter feeders. They use these legs to catch food, and then they'll um, bring them in these leg or Siri inside to to eat food. Pretty crazy, right? And again, these organisms are monoecious. So just look here really briefly. You have a full digestive system, okay? Mouth, a stomach, and an intestine, and an anus. Full thing, full digestive system. And again, they are hermaphroditic. So they have uh, male and female reproductive organs. They have testes, and they also have ovaries. But again, like, like earthworms, they cross-fertilize. And funnily enough, I think this is funny because I'm five years old. Come back. Barnacles have relative to size. Many of you may know this. Some of you don't. So this will be fun. Barnacles are the animal with the largest penis relative to its size. Now, it's not the largest penis like ever in the animal kingdom overall. That belongs to a whale. But um, I believe it's the blue whale. I'll look that up. But the barnacle has the largest penis relative to its size. And what it'll actually do is it'll it'll bring the penis out and feel around looking for other barnacles. I'm not joking, that's how it works. Okay. I think it's I think that's fun. They just bring it out and just look around. It's like another just like the other night. Yeah, okay. So that's barnacles. And most crustaceans, not most, but many crustaceans. So barnacles are in a different class than, say, the, um, and you don't have to know the class they're in, but they're in a different class from the crabs, crayfish, lobsters, and shrimp, which are the decapoda. And decapoda, you might guess, means 10 feet or appendages because they have five pairs of walking legs. That's why. Okay. And again, you're probably familiar with this, but cephalothorax, you don't have to know the number of segments. An abdomen, telson. Ooh, it's kind of hard to tell. It looks like these are uropods, and this is the telson. Just know the telson's in the middle of the uropods, okay? And then again, your kiloped, your walking legs, swimmerets, right? Antenna, antennae, antennule, okay? And maxillopeds, which are for eating. And of course, they have a mandible, and that mandible is that thing inside, underneath those maxillopeds and maxillae that does like this pretty crazy. It's really hard. It's like rock. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about sex and crustaceans. Yeah, so crabs are a little different. Do I, did I already show you a crab? I didn't. Well, it's back here. So do you notice how this abdomen is different? It's way reduced. It's basically just one abdominal segment in a crab. It's been highly reduced. And to tell a male and a female crab apart, just for fun, your male crab is here, the female crab is here, the female crabs are wider. Their bodies are wider because they hold the young, okay? And here, for crayfish, as we talked about in lab, you've got those hard spinnerets, that first, spinnerets, that's, that's spiders. The first pair of swimmerets um, are very hard, okay? They're stiff in the male. Whereas in the female, you don't have that, they're all very soft. And actually, you can't really see it. There is a hole right here. There it is. Okay. Just ignore that. Don't worry about that, y'all. Okay. Let me give, let you look at that again. So, see really stiff there? Not here. And really, you could just say the absence of those very stiff and um, prominent first swimmerettes is a clue that you're looking at a female. Okay. So, again... You've got this nice abdomen here in lobsters and crayfish, whereas in the crabs, it's highly reduced, right? Um, not sure why those barnacles are there, but you can study that. We went over all this. They're sessile. I, I think that I got this out of order, and I'm sorry. Um, hermaphroditic, and then those are their legs that they catch food with. That goes earlier. I'm sorry, guys. All right. We're still in crustaceans. Now let's talk about isopods. So isopods are also crustaceans, and they are terrestrial. They're the only true crustaceans who are terrestrial. And they are, you actually, well, you have 
um, aquatic isopods. This is an aquatic isopod. Lots of aquatic isopods in the streams that I study. Um, you also you have even some parasitic isopods that live under fish tongues. And if you played with roly polies as a child, you were actually playing with an isopod. And what does that mean? So iso meaning the same and poda meaning feet or appendages. They basically have a bunch of these walking legs that all look the same. They don't have really differentiated, super differentiated kilopeds or anything like that, like the crabs and the, the lobsters do. Okay, so that's the crustaceans. Just know the animals, okay? Just know the animals and the really prominent features of crustaceans. So now let's talk about the hexapods. So hexapoda means six feet or six appendages. And these, again, are the most largest and most successful group of animals on Earth. They're just, there's a jillion of them. Okay, there's just, there's a jillion of them. It's all really, I gotta, yeah, they're everywhere. They're just, they're all over. Do you hate insects? It's too bad. It's too bad. They're all over. It's over for you. They're there. Um, and they live everywhere. They're terrestrial. They're freshwater. There are some marine insects, but not very many. There really aren't very many. Um, and you have, you tend to have a lot more diversity in the tropics, which is really a true across all taxa, just so you know. So your book has this really beautiful table that allows you to see the various orders of insects. Just roughly no different kinds of insects. You know, you don't have to know how to, you know, know how to use a key for lab, but, eh. but this is fun to look at because there are some insects you may not be um, super familiar with. Like you may, um, so the Siphonoptera, that's the fleas. And the Isoptera, that's the termites, Odonata, dragonflies, Orthoptera, grasshoppers, Hemiptera, and so Hemiptera and Homoptera and actually Heteroptera are true bugs. They all comprise true bugs. They don't have Heteroptera in here, that's okay. You don't have to know that anyway. Hymenoptera, which are the bees, wasps, and ants. Diptera, which are the true flies, which also include mosquitoes. Lepidoptera, which are the beautiful butterflies and moths, and Coleoptera. Okay, noise, very noise. And they're actually listed here in order, in ace, uh, it looks like descending order, excuse me, of abundance. Okay, so we, most of, most are beetles. So when I look at this, and I know this isn't part of the lecture, I'm sorry. That, y'all, that looks like, that looks like a hemipteran. That looks like nodonectidae, family nodonectidae. Whatever, I'm gonna let it go. There are beetles in it. Yeah, okay, it's beetles. Yeah, there are beetles that look like that, I guess, but I don't like that, that example. Okay, okay, we're moving on. So, let's talk about them. mouth parts. Various kinds of mouth parts. You have sucking mouth parts, you have piercing mouth parts, and you have mandibular biting mouth parts, chewing mouth parts, okay? And that all has to do with the way that the insects feed and insects, and not just insects, hexapods, but most of which are insects. Um, there are only like three groups of non-insect hexapods, excuse me. They, um, their mouth parts are all related to their feeding mode, okay? And there's a pretty wide array of feeding modes because as you probably know, insects eat a wide array of food, okay? You have uh, predatory insects like the, the odonates, the dragonflies are actually very predatory. Um, you've got paras parasitic blood sucking. You've got predatory but still blood sucking. That's the hemiptera. You have like lepidopterans, right? They have this nice, nice long proboscis for getting um, nectar. And of course, chewing mouth parts for herbivorous insects. So let's look at the internal organization that you're already a little familiar with. Okay, so this is in a hymenopteran, but it is similar. So you have your mouth as you move down. Let's see where we're at here. Mouth, okay. You come all the way down and you've got your esoph esophagus here. Crop, stomach. This isn't really showing any gastric cica. Um, and then your intestine. It's not also, so also not showing the malpighian tubules, but they are there, okay. And then you've got this dorsal blood vessel with hearts and ostia in the hearts. All right, and the gonad here, 
So this would be an ovary, particularly in any bee that you probably see flying around. It's probably female. Um, and let's see, that's the main thing that I want to call attention to here, just because you've seen it so many times. But do remember that hexapods have three tegmata, so head, thorax, and abdomen. All right, how do they sense the world around them? Well, first they have seti. So seti are um, little hairs on the, on the animal. And they are for essentially sensing the environment. And a lot of the times, the seti will be found, well, it depends on the insect, but you will often find it on the extremities, on the legs. Okay, so they're actually sensing with those. Um, though sometimes you also find seti on the body of the animal, particularly on the abdomen. Um, you also have the tympanum, which is on the grasshopper we saw, it was right below, not below, behind the femur the, of the jumping legs the back legs, and that tympanum is uh, for sound, it's for sound processing, I couldn't think of the word, or audition so that they can actually hear their surroundings, um, and it's thought that there, it may also have a, a part to play in sound production in the animals as well. Um, they also use pheromones, and pheromones are chemical messengers that are used to communicate a whole host of, of signals. Um, pheromones signal territory, pheromones signal uh, mating, mating readiness. So pheromones typically are involved either in, well, fucking or fighting. It's all the same. Within the, okay, no, no, I'm going to get fired. All right, so, so this is an important thing to remember. What adaptations have contributed to insect success? That exoskeleton. A lot of the same things that make an arthropod successful, right? They have that exoskeleton that's protective. They're segmented. They have jointed appendages, so they have the ability to move. But the hexapods in particular have highly developed sense organs. They have those, those compound eyes. They have simple eyes. They have a tympanum. Well, they have two tympanum. Um, on either side, and they can fly. So that has been made them very successful as animals. And I just skipped way ahead. All right. So let's talk about insect development. Insects, in particular, go through a period of metamorphosis, just like many of the other arthropods. And oftentimes, um, this metamorphosing is is what's the word it is i can't think of words when i'm trying to record a lecture the metamorphosis is staggered that's it um so that you have you know when you have an adult and they lay an egg you don't have another you know you don't have another larva just immediately hatch into an adult right you actually have larval stages and pupal stages and these larvae and these pupa pupae they develop over time, so that actually reduces intraspecific competition for mates and food. So it's pretty ingenious. And actually, in, in ecosystems, various types of insects, both freshwater and terrestrial, the life cycles themselves of the different groups are staggered. And so, for example, in aquatic systems, you'll have one group of nymphs or babies, larvae, emerge as adults several weeks before another group is emerging. So you have a reduction in interspecific competition in that way, which is pretty cool, I think. The timing is so perfect. Okay, that's all about the hexapods in lecture. Not too bad, right? I hope not. I hope some of you are not sitting there going like, this is too much. Just, just know the really important things about these animals. And in our last um, meetup, I think what I'm going to do, not I don't think, I know. So our last meetup is the last day of class. And I think this Friday and next Friday, I would like to kind of review a little bit some of the really high points that you really want to be sure to pay attention to. Make sure that you spend a lot of time um, thinking about and studying. So just be aware of that. We're actually going to talk about that. I have plans to highlight you know, not just to be like study these things, but things that are going to be particularly important for you to learn and take away from this class this Friday and um, next Friday, May 1st. Okay, cool. And 
you know, I'm off, also open to doing an extra review session if you want to, though I think it would be more efficient for you, given all the time that you are spending already on class, that we try to do it on Fridays, right? Okay, cool. So let's go on to our last, um, our last subphylum of arthropods, and then I think we'll have a few minutes just to start on deuterostomes, because I'm trying to go ahead and get you through it if we can. So, and I, um, I'm actually going to be shortening some of the lectures on deuterostomes and cutting out some of the extra stuff we talk about, because just really to, to make efficient use of your time. Okay, so let's talk about myriapods. The myriapods are the mini-legged dudes. They're the mini-legged. Many feet. Lots of them. That I means that's what it means. I'm not joking. That's what it's called. Myriapods. <laughs> Myria means many. Poda means feet or appendages. So let's talk about it. So kilopods and the kilopods. So kilopods are the centipedes. Okay. And the kilopods are, so the kilopods and the diplopods, which are the millipedes, are fundamentally different animals. My dog. Oh, here. You want to just check out? My dog. I'm teaching on my couch right now. It seemed like a good spot today. Tonight. It's night. Okay. Yes. I. Are you like, you're like, wait, are you lecturing like around the clock at this point? Yes. I am. Okay. So, kilopods. Kilopods. Something right here. Hold on. Yes, I know what I'm doing. Yes, I'm sorry. This is not a subclass. I don't know why it's a subclass. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a class. I don't want to confuse you. This is a class. This is the super secret content. I did that on purpose, so I, you had to watch. That's exactly what happened. Nobody called me on this last year. Okay. So, um, anyway, these are the kilopods. And they have one pair of appendages per segment. One. Okay. And they are carnivorous. And so centipedes, if you see them, they actually eat other arthropods. Um, so they're kind of actually nice to have around as long as you don't pick one up because they can bite you because they have poison fangs to subdue prey. They're not to actually hurt you, though they will use them for defense, but they are particularly for subduing prey. Okay. And one other thing about these guys' body plan is they're pretty, their doors are eventually flattened. So they're kind of flat. They're flat dudes. All right. So let's talk about the pods. I hate being run up. I need to tell Dr. Jones we share these. So, diplopoda. Diplo means two, guys. So this is a good way to remember that millipedes have two pairs of legs on each segment. Diplopoda. Okay. Now, millipedes will not bite you. Millipedes are super nice, and they just want to be your friend. Actually, they don't. They want to stay away from you. Um, but they are herbivorous, so they eat organic matter. They're not carnivorous. They do not have poison fangs like kilopods. And they tend to be more rounded. They're not dorsoventrally flattened. They're rounded. And since they don't really have any way to defend themselves with, like, fangs, they produce a very bad smelling fluid as a defense. So basically, if you pick up a millipede and then it smells terrible, it's because you made it like vomit its badness. Yep. So, some characteristics of the myriapods, just so you know, that are shared across kilopods and diplopods. All right, they have a head and then they have numerous segments, not just like three tegmata or a cephalothorax and an abdomen, but many. Okay. They're gonochoric, so you have you have male centipedes and female centipedes, same with millipedes. These organisms uh, have internal fertilization and lay eggs, and they actually will just keep adding segments on as they grow, which is kind of cute if you think about it. And here you see eggs on the underside here. Okay, so that's the myriapods, and myriapods. Uh, you know, they're mostly seen as, as pests, but for humans, they're also in many parts of the world, not so much in the United States, but in other parts of the world, they're actually important sources of food, and they're very popular food sources. Here you have some fried-up centipedes, um, 
it appears to be in an Asian market, uh, and they're they're full of protein, man. I mean, uh, why not? You know? Yeah. It's way better for the environment. Trust me. I'm not joking. Okay. That's all about the protostumps. Oh my gosh, we did it. Hold on. I need some lemonade. Oh no, I'm out. Ah, oh, it's okay. Okay. Y'all, I'm going to be diabetic by the end of this quarantine because I love lemonade and I've been letting myself have it. So much sugar. Okay, so those are the protostomes. We're done. Oh my god. <gasps> We're done. Ziggy. 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 We're done with the protostomes. High five. High five. Okay. Listen. I want to talk about deuterostomes. I know. I know. I know you're tired, but just hang with me. For like five or ten more minutes, let's just get started with some deuterostomes, and then you can do something else. Okay, so here we are. This is the last chapter. Chapter 35, last chapter. The final chapter. Last chapter. Okay, so if we can get three kinoderms, man, we, we're doing good, but we'll see. All right, so here you have a sea urchin and a in America, a bald eagle. What is the relationship between these organisms? They're both deuterostomes. Two phyla, deuterostomes, Echinodermata and Chordata. Echinodermata and Chordata. All right, here we are. We've made it. Oh my gosh. We went all the way through this. You did it. You made it. And now we're here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Echinodermata. Let's do it. What does it mean? That's right. Wait, I should wait. Looked at my watch that I don't wear. Looking at my watch I don't wear. Spiny skinned. Exactly. Organisms are exclusively marine. They have a skeleton made of spicules that sticks out of their body. That's terrifying. And they are pentaradially symmetrical. Check it. I know. Can't believe it either. We're essentially going to review what we did in the lab. That's what we're going to do. It's going to be great. Are you ready? Okay. Just showing you some here. Just for funsies. Oh, wow. There's more. Got some sea urchins. Got some sand dollars. We're going to the beach today, guys. Brutal stars. <gasps> sea cucumbers. I love sea cucumbers. Do you love them now? You really need to look up some sea cucumber videos. All right, so let's talk about the the origin of echinoderms. We don't know. But the cl best clue we have is based on their larvae, which is bilaterally symmetrical. That's the best clue that we have. Okay, they have a bilaterally symmetrical larva, even though they are pentaradially symmetrical as adults. So that is our clue into the common origin of echinoderms. And so again, they start out bilaterally symmetrical and then become pentaradially symmetrical, though, um, you know, not perfectly. And you have this oral surface. It is their mouth. Well, that's actually showing you the mouth, sorry. But I was just pointing to them too. This is easily pentaradially symmetrical. Not so easy to, to parse out here. But if you looked at the organism head on. So, and that's what that pentaradial symmetry is about. Looking at the organism head on. They do not have a centralized nervous system. So that's a pretty interesting thing about the echinoderms. No centralized nervous system. Okay. They have this endoskeleton. It's made of calcium carbonate ossicles and is covered by their, their epidermis. Um, and they have, they can, well, they can be tightly or loosely jointed, depending on the echinoderm we're talking about. Okay. Because there are lots of different kinds. A pretty wide diversity in this phylum. All right. And we talked about the water vascular system, which is really important for the organism, primarily for movement, but it's also important for, well, really important for gas exchange as well, and has a role to play in feeding as well. So movement, feeding, and gas exchange, because uh, the water vascular system controls the movement of tube feet, and that tube feet, those tube feet are really important for movement, really important for breaking apart, like food, mollusks. Uh, bivalves and eating them 
and bringing in water, the pool of oxygen into the animal. So it's important for those three things. We mainly talked about it in terms of eating and movement, but it's important for all of those things in the animal. Okay, so if you come in here, come in here. Oh, no, not in there. There. Now come back. Okay, so let's go through that water vascular system briefly. So you have your madreporite where that water comes in. The madreporite is connected to the, it is not showing the stone canal. The stone canal is connected to the ring canal. The ring canal is connected to the radial canal. The radial is connected to the, well, the ampullae, really. And then the tube feet. That's the water vascular system. Here's those two feet that are in the um, ambulacral grooves, right? Okay, so just remember that. Sing that song as much as you need to. And it helps to remember the ring canal is a ring, and the radial canal is in the ray. And in that ray, and in that ray, and in that ray. That's, their, that's the name for their arms, okay? Other things about these guys. Remember when we digested, when we digested them, that was weird, uh, dissected them, you have digestive glands. They're kind of like greeny, gooey looking things, all right, that are important for digestion in the animal. When we took that out, we could see that ring canal with the ampullae that are connected to the two feet, okay? And um, you also had uh, the, the, the gonads in here as well, and each ray has the same stiff. And here in the center of the animal, so here we, we are looking at the aboral surface, so the anus is on this side, but the stomach is also in there. And you have, and okay, I just said the stomach, and you can't really differentiate easily when you're dissecting the animal, but they do have a cardiac and pyloric stomach. I'm not going to make you know that. Like, I'm not going to be like, tell me about the cardiac and pyloric stomach. But just know the cardiac stomach is important for processing the food, and that pyloric stomach is important for chemical digestion, much like your stomach. Okay? And then on the oral surface, on the underside there, you're going to have your mouth. All right. So, gas exchange. You have the body surface and the tube feet. Right, but the madrepora is bringing also water in with oxygen, okay? And you have, you actually, you don't have to know that. I'm not going to make you know about the papillae grip branches and these organisms. But I will just mention, this is just showing you essentially the flow of water in the organism, okay? But you don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Um, we're going to move on from that. I'm trying to kind of condense things to just what you absolutely really need. So... Fun thing about these organisms, they can regenerate limbs, okay? And to eat, they evert their digestive system, and they can regenerate that too. That's right. If you take off the arm of a starfish, they can regrow it. And when ski cucumbers evert their digestive system for defense, they grow it back. That's a superpower as far as I'm concerned. So this is actually a fun thing about sea cucumbers. Please watch it. It's super fun. So after this is over, watch the spider video and the sea cucumber video, okay? Great. Um, and before we get into the different kinds, we're just going to finish this overview with reproduction. So they can reproduce asexually, but most reproduce sexually, externally. So they release their gametes into the water, and they are fertilized there. And you have gonochoric. Most of the organisms are gonochoric. Not most. They're all gonochoric, which is where you have male and female individuals, okay? And they have free swimming larvae. Uh oh, sorry guys. So, uh, yeah, they're free swimming larvae. That's one characteristic of this of these organisms. Okay, this is just showing you the lar the development in the different classes, but you don't have to really know that. It's just to show you uh, that bilateral symmetry. Um, and this is showing you essentially embryonic development of muscle tissue. That's all that's showing you. So, you know, so you're just seeing larvae there. Okay. Okay. So that's all I want to talk about with the echinoderms now. The next time we come back, we're going to go through each class, which you already know a lot about. So it's really just going to be review. And then we're going to move into chordates. And um, we're just going to, I'm going to try to finish up. Um, I, I'm going to have to look. So that's all for right now. Moving forward, looking forward. Um, next lecture. So on Friday, we're going to finish echinoderms, and we're going to move into chordates. And chordates are the last thing we talk about, but we talk about the various subphyla, including vertebrates, and then 
I have more lectures, but I'm going to go through those and kind of cut them down to what we really need for you to know, because I used to go through all the different kinds of birds, and, and maybe I will leave those up there. So yes, I'm going to leave the full slides up there for you to have, because I know some of you will love to see these animals, and I still want to give you the opportunity to see them and to learn some of the different classes of avians and things like that. But I'm going to, for your purposes, just lecture over the things we really need to know to save time and to save your sanity a little bit. Okay, cool. So that's that was a whole class. You're done. You did it. It's Wednesday. Hopefully it's Wednesday. Oh, gosh, please let it be Wednesday. I mean, it's not Wednesday here, but it, it is maybe. If you're watching this before Wednesday, the highest of fives. But so I just remember I need to post your to do's and Morty's Earth Day challenge. Oh, yeah, it's Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. OK, so that's all. Do be sure. I'll just remind you this week you've watched. This is hopefully your second video. Be sure to watch a video for Friday. Be sure to watch your lab. It's over Echinoderms Recordate. So we're just like reviewing a bunch of stuff. You're seeing things multiple times. And I know you're probably like, why do I have to see them multiple times? Well, I think they'll help you remember them for your life. So maybe do that. Do your worksheet before Friday at midnight. And you have a quiz before Friday at midnight. Okay. Let me know if you need anything.